If you missed the last episode of Catalyst, go back and listen. If you're caught up, here's where we left off. Do you remember me telling you about the case in the summer of 2004, the Jesse Valencia murder case? It was kind of a hot button issue at that time, you know, with a gay person. Were you ever worried for his safety because he was gay? It always made me nervous. I was so concerned that something was going to happen, which it did. While police won't call it a hate crime, they do say the fact the victim was gay may help solve the case. What your family was going through was something that I had never experienced before as a reporter or in life. It took the jury just nine hours to find former Columbia police officer Stephen Rios guilty in the June 2004 murder of his lover. This was kind of in front of everybody, laid out there so everybody could see it. This could be their kid or their brother or something like that. Losing my son was like lo losing a part of my heart. I miss him very much, and that I wish I could have taken his place. Nearly 20 years ago, the murder of a gay college student in Missouri was the first time I really had to stop and question, how do I cover this story as a gay journalist objectively? Today, for the LGBTQ plus journalists at KXAN, the record number of bills filed in Texas that would impact their community brought similar questions and presented an opportunity. We wanted to produce our outlaw project in a way our audience would know we're striving to maintain objectivity and fairness, ensuring complete, accurate reporting through editorial scrutiny, collaboration, and, of course, style guides and best practices from the industry. We also wanted to be transparent about our process and the inner challenges we face when looking into issues like those. That's why we're sharing these conversations with members of our team, some LGBTQ+, and others. My name is Kelsey Thompson. I am a digital journalist here at KXAN. My name is Will Dupree. I'm an anchor and reporter here at KXAN. I was raised in a really strong Roman Catholic household, went to Catholic school for 10 years, and that just didn't seem like an option for me at that time to be anything other than straight. So ultimately, I didn't really come to terms with my sexuality until I was late in college. And around that time is when I started coming out to friends and family and getting to live a more authentic life that I feel like I'm still working on today, but I would say at this point I'm very comfortable identifying as bisexual. My coming out journey happened pretty late in life. Came out as gay at 26. I'm 35 now, so the vast majority of my life has been closeted, but it just took a long time to admit it, and now it's figuring out who I am, <laughs> living in my full truth. My name is Jose Torres, and I produce the 10 o'clock newscast for KXAN. My name is Cora Nice. I'm a digital reporter and weekend assignment editor. So I came out in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s. I was 21. There was a little nerve wracking for me. There was a lot of anxiety. I just didn't know how to come out. Uh, but when I did, everyone was very supportive. So, I mean, closet for like 20 plus years finally like sort of gave me the push to like start transition and come out a very different place now, but also like one I feel more confident and like better about myself. My name is Shayla Washington. I am an anchor and multicultural reporter with KXAN. I'm Santos Gonzalez. I'm a producer for KXAN News. What makes your perspective unique in the newsroom? So I'm black. I'm a minority. I'm a woman. 
and I grew up watching the news every single morning with my mom, but I didn't necessarily always see a lot of people who looked like me growing up, whether that be on TV or in my community. It made me want to step into the field to maybe be more of that representation. I think certain lived experiences growing up in a predominantly white community really shape who you are. My parents are both from Mexico. Came over, my mom didn't get her citizenship until I was maybe five. My dad still has his green card. And so we were never, you know, privileged growing up. That life experience kind of gives me a perspective on things that I think is kind of unique in this newsroom. How does that influence your coverage, do you think? I definitely tend to gravitate more on immigration problem. And migrants in general is where I kind of focus on because there are unique problems to them that not many people uh, are even aware of. So I think it's important to kind of highlight those things and kind of show what is going on in these communities where a lot of people feel like they don't have a voice. And I try to kind of hopefully bring in that into the conversation. I'm always seeking to elevate minority voices. I'm seeking to tell minority stories. And the range of stories that I'm telling, it can be anything from stories happening in the Black Latino community to the LGBTQ plus community could be just telling stories of women who are shattering glass ceilings. I just think in the daily news cycle, oftentimes those stories don't get a lot of attention. Unless you have a person who's really seeking out those stories, I think that they kind of slip through the cracks. How's your job intersected with being a member of the LGBTQ plus community? I remember when I was a newspaper reporter at my previous job in Austin, I was talking to this woman and she let it slip that she was married to a woman and then she had this whole like moment where she had to pause and be like, do I want this on record, do I not? And you know, I didn't want to pressure her one way or another and I just said like, whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable with, we'll go with that. And seeing her have the courage to say, I have a wife and I'm proud of that, really resonated with me of, the way that you can normalize just various sexualities, gender identities and experiences just by giving people that peace of mind and comfort when you're interviewing them. I think also one of the like key points is as being a transgender reporter, I think a lot of people in my community are very like wary of cisgender reporters based on how some of that media coverage of transgender people isn't always informed or is coming at it from like a place of, of spectacle. There have been interviews I've gotten in here where people have said that they received like a ton of other interview requests but only talk to me. And part of that is like access, but it's also like these stories won't get told because people are too wary of talking to people, but they need to be told. There's just been in the last maybe two or three years, a more pronounced effort to legislate aspects of the LGBTQ community. And you get to see the impacts of that and how people around you are reacting to those developments. And so it, it just plays a factor in wanting to do this work and keep doing it well. I uh, went to a workshop a few years ago and they really reinforced the idea that everyone is the same. So it doesn't mean that you have to go and talk to the LGBT community for an LGBTQ issue. You can talk to them in, about taxes, about whatever, because they're part of our community. I feel like when someone opens themselves up to do an interview or talk to you or you ask questions of them about their life, no matter what it is, if you are coming at it with an open heart, kindness, respect, it can only benefit the story and what you're doing. At what point did you know being out could come with risks? So actually I have two uncles who I love very dearly and both of them identify as gay. So that was kind of my first exposure of meeting a queer couple and getting to see that as not this foreign concept. but. A real thing. One of them was unfortunately really violently mugged when he was living in San Francisco and it came after he was seen holding hands with his partner at the time. And that was a personal story that I think really stuck with me and made me realize the difficulties and dangers that can come. And then, you know, it's just working in this industry candidly, you see a lot of stories of particularly trans people of color who have been violently attacked and murdered. And I think that has really 
brought a reality to the situation that maybe when I was early on in my journey, I didn't see as clearly. As a trans feminine person, I learned that those risks were like pretty apparent before like coming out, especially like growing up in the 90s and the early 2000s. When I got a little older, you see a lot more of the actual reporting on crime against transgender people. It sort of feels like a big red flag or like a warning, this could happen to you sort of thing. But it also takes some time, I think, to like push through that. So in the mid 90s, there was the killing of Matthew Shepard. So that was kind of frightening that it was all over the news. And you know, you didn't want to hopefully think that would happen to you, but you just never know. Where I grew up is a small town. Probably the worst thing you could be called was gay, but it was just trying to survive in that environment. And by keeping it in, it kept me going. Not long after I moved here to Austin, I was walking downtown with a friend and someone drove by in a truck and yelled the F word at us. And, you know, I had not heard that in such a scary, offensive way for a very long time. Those memories of dealing with insecurity and trying to hide those certain things, it all comes flooding back. Have you ever encountered any hate as an LGBTQ plus journalist? Social media has a way of opening a very dark side of people's reactions. There's been a number of times where the mentions on my Twitter account have just been very, very ugly for an article you write. And you feel pride in because you feel like you've done it as objectively as possible, as comprehensively as possible. As part of our job, you want to feel like people can connect with you in any way. But that also opens the floodgates for those negative things to happen. And there have been bad names thrown my way because of articles that I've done. And it is very scary and kind of almost makes you weary of moving forward and doing those types of stories. But that feeling is always fleeting. For me, at least, I just want to keep doing it and trying to do my best. While I'm working, people can be sort of disrespectful in how they interact with me during the reporting process. Like sources? Uh, on occasion with misgendering and that sort of thing. It's always a possibility, so. Always in the back of your head. Yeah, like deleting my pronouns out of emails I'm sending to some people but not others because I'm like, how are they going to view me during this initial communications? It still definitely is something that's hard, especially in an industry where we value this idea of objectivity and we want to make sure that we're not swaying a story one way or another, but at the same time, our identity is part of who we are. What's it been like working in a newsroom in a state where so many policies have been introduced recently by lawmakers to restrict the LGBTQ plus community? It's really difficult, honestly, because you have the professional side of yourself where you know that you have a standard to cover the nuance of perspectives and opinions and dialogue surrounding an issue. And you want to encapsulate that in your reporting, but you're also almost having to compartmentalize part of yourself and not let that bleed into or interfere with your reporting, even though it's a very personal issue that impacts a huge part of your identity. So. It's been really encouraging being in this newsroom where there's a lot of other out queer people. If I was in a different newsroom where I was the only out person, this might be a completely different thing and not a sustainable thing for me to be doing. But like now it feels like there's support. Some people might question whether people in this community can also be unbiased, balanced, journalists when it comes to covering related issues? I think that's a question that a lot of people get even beyond just sexual orientation or gender identity. It could be what are your personal political beliefs and how does that influence the way you report? This is the same sort of thought process that is used against black reporters, women reporters. Whether or not we can be on bias, balanced journalists, I think absolutely. And I think sometimes it takes the knowledge that we have to be unbiased. Reporting is so much more than just being spoon-fed something and spitting it back out. It's really trying to understand why does someone feel this way about this policy. 
It can be challenging though, especially when the topic is controversial. That's why it's important to show your work, and this podcast is part of that. For our Outlaw Project, we also wanted to show where the work took us, across Texas far beyond the capital, from Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston, to San Antonio, and even El Paso. Over six months, we researched financial records, requested decades of criminal and court documents, and scoured hours of video, audio, and newspaper archives spanning more than 160 years. We interviewed dozens of people on all sides of the issues and worked collaboratively to be transparent and scrutinize the content we collected and the stories we would eventually share. We also made certain we reached out to the subjects of our stories multiple times, giving them ample opportunity to respond to our reporting. That meant listening openly and being honest about their viewpoints in a straightforward way that doesn't amplify hate speech or attacks against others. Many of the lawmakers and the supporters pushing these policies impacting the LGBTQ community never responded to emails, calls, or door knocks. Some sent statements reaffirming their reasons for introducing a bill, often focused on faith and family. We worked to convey that in addition to using what they've written and said during testimony on these topics in the past. And it forces you to turn around and think what the other side is feeling and thinking and research their beliefs to try to get that perspective. Why was this policy introduced? What are the ramifications or the benefits that it could pose? And I think having that innate curiosity that journalists have is really important in that situation. Have you identified any blind spots or bias you've had to recognize and overcome? It's realistic that everybody is biased. You just have to be willing to check that. That's a daily thing. Every time I go into an, our morning editorial meetings, I look at a situation and I already have a certain viewpoint on it. So I have to recognize that, kind of step back and let people talk about their perspectives. It's always a two-way road. And if we're not there to establish that, then the meaning gets lost along the way. So I think being upfront about my passion for a story is everything because I never want anyone to think that I've got an agenda. Like I said, certain stories are just a little bit closer to the heart. Luckily, we are in a great environment here at KXAN where the managers who are reading over your scripts are going to be really respectful of your background and who you are. They trust you as a journalist as well. And I think after having those conversations, they want to make sure that you're okay with the end product. And I think that's powerful. It makes you feel very respected. It makes you feel really valued. And I think that's how you ensure the end product is not only a product that you're proud of as a journalist, but also a product that you can be proud of as a station. How do you handle outside criticism that you're too close to the subject? I would just say, read the articles, watch the stories, because they are as comprehensive as possible and respectful enough to cover every aspect of that debate. It's very intentional. It's a part of my job and I take it very seriously. Everybody hates criticism, including me. It's okay if not everybody agrees with what you're saying. So instead of being defensive, I take a second, walk away, do what I need to do, but then I go back to that criticism and I really analyze it and see what it is there that people might be criticizing. And I try to take that and move forward to be better the next time around. It's a conversation happening across the industry, as some journalism leaders, the decision makers and guides, tell us next time. Realistically, you can't hide who you are. I think the perennial debate that is very inflamed right now in storytelling spaces, journalism, media, is the term objectivity. I identify blind spots all the time because my experience is very limited. So I think I can learn a lot from inviting other voices in the conversation. Special thanks to KXAN journalists Will Dupree, Santos Gonzalez, Cora Nice, Kelsey Thompson, Jose Torres, and Jayla Washington for speaking with us for this episode. To explore our full interactive investigation and docuseries that accompany this podcast, go to kxan.com outlaw. Catalyst is reported and produced by me, Josh Hinkle, along with Arzo Dost. Our editor is Richie Bowes. Digital support comes from Eric Henriksen, Abigail Jones, Jacqueline Ramkasun, Andrew Schnitker, Robert Sims, and Kate Winkle.
KXAN's news director is Haley Cyhawk, and its vice president and general manager is Eric Glassberg. Thank you.